Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Today, I am taking you back to a case from the 90s. It's a case that many people probably have never heard about. But then, in 2018, there was a Navy veteran by the name of Judy Farmer, she discovered that at Arlington National Cemetery, there was a veteran who was interred there, but he wasn't just a regular veteran who just happened to pass away. The reason this veteran passed away is because he died on death row on the electric chair. I know you're probably wondering what? He died on death row on the electric chair because this veteran killed a Navy sailor and raped her. What? How could that be? How could this guy be interred at Arlington National Cemetery? And would he be there forever? Join me today as I tell you the tragic story of a sailor by the name of Melissa Harrington and how her cause moved some bigwigs in DC to make some changes for the sake of justice. Now, let's dig in. A trigger warning before I begin, this episode discusses rape and murder. Listener discretion is advised. On July 9, 1991, at around 6.20 a.m., Navy sailor Melissa Harrington was leaving her house. Her house was located on the 2400 block of Spinnaker Court off of Shore Drive in Virginia Beach. She was stationed at Norfolk Naval Base just up the road. When all of a sudden she was getting into her vehicle and she was attacked by a man who put his arm around her neck and then forced her into a car driven by a second perpetrator. As Melissa was being accosted, neighbors heard screams coming from outside, and by the time they were able to go outside or get to a window to see what was happening, they saw Melissa's car door open. Inside the car, it appeared that Melissa had already gotten her lunch and other items into the vehicle when all of a sudden she was attacked. Clearly, neighbors knew it was Melissa's car, But as reported by Matthew Bowers, since they didn't see Melissa's abduction, all they said was that they heard a semi-hysterical woman yelling, no, no, no. Neighbors did, however, see the vehicle that took off with the woman. It was a white Ford Taurus and some very savvy neighbors even got a full license plate number that they quickly provided to the police. Police acted as quickly as humanly possible to run the license plate number and it came back to a vehicle owned by 34-year-old Andrew J. Chabrol. But the plate was not for a white Taurus. Andrew lived in the 1400 block of Pamlico Boulevard in Chesapeake, which was about a 30-minute drive from Melissa's house. Of course, the police could have just headed to his house, but they wanted to be sure they got the right place. You see, like I said, the license plate belonged to Andrew, but it didn't belong to a white car. So it wasn't until after 10 a.m. when Andrew took his car out of the garage that the police knew they got the right place. So police knocked on Andrew's door at around 11.45 a.m. Inside the home, they found Andrew and they found a 32-year-old man named Stanley Berkeley. Stanley was actually new in town, having just arrived to the States from the Virgin Islands. The cops asked Andrew if they could look around and Andrew was like, no, no, you cannot. You cannot look around without a warrant. Well, hours later, at around 2.30 p.m., police arrived at Andrew's house with a search warrant in hand. When police walked into the home, their main concern was finding Melissa. Sadly, by the time they arrived, they were too late. As they entered the back bedroom, they discovered Melissa's lifeless body. As reported by the Washington Post, Melissa was rolled up in a rug. There are other reports that say that she was rolled up in a blanket. The two men, Andrew and Stanley, were immediately arrested. Andrew saying he didn't care if Melissa was alive or dead 
and being very nonchalant about the fact that he was being arrested. And it was after Melissa's body was discovered that the true connection between Andrew and Melissa became clear. Melissa Harrington was a 27-year-old sailor and she was happily married to another sailor. While she was in the Navy, Lieutenant Andrew Chabrol, yes, yes, that guy worked in the same unit as Melissa, although I read that he was not her direct supervisor. And just a reminder that a lieutenant in the Navy is an O3, aka a captain in every other branch of the military. But listen, instead of conducting himself in a professional manner, as is expected of officers, Andrew became obsessed with Melissa when they worked together. Oftentimes, he made inappropriate passes at her, asking her to engage in not only an adulterous relationship with him because, hello, they were both married, but he also was violating the fraternization rules of the military. But Andrew did not care. He was obsessed. Well, Melissa was not impressed with Andrew and she did not reciprocate his feelings. In fact, she did the right thing and she reported Andrew's actions up the chain of command. From what I gathered from historic reporting on this case, Andrew was given a slap on the wrist and he was allowed to separate from the military with an honorable discharge. Now that's an absolute disgrace when you learn what he does next. But before Andrew left the military, he threatened Melissa that if her sexual harassment complaint caused him any separation, honorable or not, she would, quote, never live to tell about it, end quote. Melissa, while not uber excited that Andrew got an honorable discharge, I imagine she was happy to no longer have to work directly for or with Lieutenant Andrew. Sadly, her horror did not end there. What Melissa didn't realize was that her nightmare had just begun. You see, after leaving the Navy, Andrew became obsessed with the idea of destroying, raping, and killing Melissa. After Melissa's death, when they searched Andrew's home, they confiscated various journals where Andrew meticulously described his to-do list. He described his sick, sick fantasies. Mind you, Andrew Chabrol was married with two kids. Yes! As reported by Matthew Bowers, Andrew's wife was Irish and she was living in Dublin, Ireland at the time. She was over there raising their two sons while Andrew was over in Virginia being a creep. As reported in the Supreme Court of Virginia opinion on this case, Andrew kept his journals in discs. The discs contained various letters. These letters contained information that Melissa rebuffed Andrew's advances and that because she reported him, he began to plot his revenge. He wrote things like, quote, she will suffer in the long run, quote, I plan to rape her, quote, I will give her the final payoff. He wrote about his plan to abduct Melissa and then kill her. And this wasn't just a place for Andrew to vent. No, no, no. He took other actions before the actual abduction. He purchased powdered magnesium. He also purchased 10 gallons of gasoline because he would use both that and the magnesium to burn Melissa's body. In the journal, Andrew contemplated framing Melissa's husband for the murder. In referring to his evil plan to kill Melissa, he referred to her as his nemesis and the plan as Operation Nemesis. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. 
Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like, and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, and it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. An autopsy of Melissa's body would reveal that when she was discovered, her body was wrapped in a blanket and that silver duct tape completely covered her face from eyebrows to chin. And it was wrapped as tightly as possible around her head. In essence, Dr. Leah Bush, the medical examiner who performed the autopsy, She revealed that it was evident that it would have been virtually impossible for a human to breathe with duct tape wrapped the way it was around the victim's head and face. Dr. Bush also found bruises over Melissa's collarbone, her right upper arm, her left posterior arm, her right leg, and her left knee. Many of her bruises were consistent with blunt force trauma. She also had electrical burns on her thighs. It would later be revealed that these burns were caused by a stun gun. Dr. Bush concluded that Melissa died as a result of mechanical asphyxiation due to suffocation and strangulation. The perpetrator, it appeared, used a ligature and then he applied manual pressure. But there were so many things that independently could have killed the victim, including the duct tape and the plastic bag tied around her head and neck. Whoever did this to Melissa clearly had a depraved heart. Well, after the two men in the home where Melissa was discovered dead were arrested, one of them started to send the other notes from jail. Yes, I can't make this stuff up. Andrew Chabrol once sent Stanley a note that read, quote, remember as little about me as possible. He also asked the other dude to not recall anything. One of the notes even mentioned necro, which Andrew would later clarify referred to necrophilia, which is the act of having sex with a dead body. So in this case, even though Andrew Chabrol appeared to be skirting responsibility for Melissa's death, he soon changed his tune. With the egregiousness of this case, it's not surprising to learn that Virginia was seeking the death penalty. Not only did Melissa endure a horrendous death, as we will soon learn, but the relationship between her and her perpetrator began from a working relationship where Andrew just became obsessed. I have heard that there are certain jurisdictions where you cannot plead guilty to capital murder, but that was not the case in 1992 in Virginia. And for whatever reason, Andrew ended up pleading guilty to Melissa's murder. And this is the horrific story that he told the court. Again, trigger warning, this involves brutal rape, 
Listener discretion is advised. On July 9th, 1991, Andrew asked his friend Stanley Berkeley, who was new in town, to help him with something. That morning, the men drove from Andrew's house in Chesapeake to Melissa's house in Virginia Beach. Andrew didn't want Melissa to recognize him, so he wore a disguise, sunglasses, a hat, and a wig. As Melissa was about to get into her car that morning, as evidenced by her lunch and clothes already being inside, Andrew ran up to her and put his arm around her neck, causing Melissa to scream. They both fell to the ground in the struggle as Melissa yelled for help. Andrew quickly forced Melissa into the back seat of his car as his friend, Stanley, was the getaway driver. Andrew quickly taped Melissa's feet, hands, eyes, and mouth. While in the car, Andrew disguised his voice and he told Melissa not to worry that he was taking her to see somebody, but that they wouldn't hurt her. While the drive to Andrew's house was only about 30 minutes, it must have felt like an eternity for the blindfolded victim. Upon arriving at Andrew's house, he cut Melissa's leg restraints and led her into his home and then directly into his bedroom. In the bedroom, Andrew tied Melissa to some restraints that he had previously set up in anticipation of this very moment. Her legs were tied to the bottom post, where the closest she could bring her legs together were within four inches apart. He also tied her hands above her head. Andrew stayed in the room with Melissa as Stanley stayed in the living room. In that room, Andrew revealed his true identity to Melissa. He then told her he was going to rape her. Melissa asked him if he would release her afterwards, and he said yes. Melissa simply responded, okay. Mind you, all four of her limbs were tied. She had nowhere to go. There was nowhere for her to run. But Andrew, in his sick, demented mind, would later actually argue that he took her okay as consent to have sex with him. Absolutely disgusting. After raping a terrified Melissa, Andrew exited the room and then he basically gave Stanley permission to rape Melissa as well. When Andrew walked back into the room alone this time, he began to ask Melissa questions. Little did he know she had gotten one of her hands free from the restraint and she slapped or punched him across the face. Now, the court opinions simply says that she struck him across the face. And that's when Andrew began to strangle Melissa. Then he picked up a stun gun he purchased for this very moment and he tried to use it. As they struggled, Andrew later told the courts that he, quote, went berserk. He went for the jugular. And then when he came to, she was lying face down. So he's basically saying, I blacked out when I was killing her, I guess. When he came to, he said he saw a stiletto heel laying near her and fearing she would rise up and stab him with it, he cut her restraints off her hands and used those same restraints as a ligature to tighten around her neck. He then wrapped duct tape around her face. He said that he did this to cover her nose to stop her from coming back to life. Then, to make sure she was dead, he tied a plastic bag around her head. Now, this is all very graphic, but there is a reason for this level of detail in this case. After he was done, Andrew ran and told Stanley that he killed Melissa. Then they decided to keep up with the plan. I mean, let's be honest. This Andrew character kept a detailed journal about wanting to kill Melissa. He could never in a million years claim that this was anything but premeditated. In any event, they went into hypercleaning mode and placed all the evidence into two separate trash bags. Then Stanley called for a pizza to be delivered. The pizza arrived a little after 10 a.m. and then roughly at around 11.45, 11.50 a.m., there was a knock on the front door. It was the police. Andrew invited the cops in and the cops were like, hey, we're here. We want to take a look around. And like I said earlier, Andrew was like, you're not searching this house without a warrant. And so that's what police went to do. They went to get a warrant. However, they had the house under surveillance the entire time. When police arrived a couple of hours later, a little bit after 2 p.m., police were like, listen, you don't have to talk to us, but we do have a warrant. At which point, Andrew, no kidding, said, I don't care if she's alive or not. And that he, quote, was not interested if anything had happened to her. It wouldn't take long for authorities to find Melissa's body in the bedroom. They also found the two trash bags 
one containing the victim's clothes and the other containing rope, wig, a roll of duct tape, and some bedding. They also took a computer, discs, and a box of diaries. After finding Melissa's body at Andrew's house, both Andrew and Stanley were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Outside of Andrew's house was a media frenzy, as you can imagine. Some of the neighbors were interviewed, and this is what they had to say about Andrew and the situation that July 9th afternoon. They said that Andrew left active duty in January or February of 1991, and by all accounts, he was still unemployed. A few neighbors described him as a great guy and meticulous about his yard which kind of reminds me of the Golden State Killer in BTK, but anyway. Sadly, it appears that police were already watching Andrew's house starting as early as 8.30 a.m. One neighbor reported being outside in his yard when he started to see dark sedans just cruising by. At one point, one dark sedan stopped and asked this man if he had seen a white car parked in a garage. Now, it's unclear if the cop asked this or whether or not there was a white car parked in this man's garage. In any event, the sedan drove off and shortly thereafter, Andrew Chabrol came out of his house. The neighbor walked over to Andrew and was like, isn't it weird that all these cars keep driving by? Andrew wasn't in the mood for small talk. Then the neighbor noticed a deep cut on Andrew's chin. The neighbor was like, hey, what's going on with your chin? But Andrew didn't respond. And at that point, the neighbor was like, well, listen, you probably want to get your chin checked out today. Andrew then opened his garage and took his white sedan and parked it on the street. That was at about 9 a.m. At about 11 a.m., Domino's delivered a pizza to the house. And then at 11.45 a.m., the police car started to roll up. By early afternoon, there was an excess of 30 police vehicles and crime scene tax who had taken over the scene. Back at Norfolk Naval Base, Melissa's husband was called back from his own military duty. You see, he was assigned to Wallops Island. and When he was called back, that's when he learned about his wife's death. When the media went searching to learn more about Melissa, they learned that she was a tiny little thing. She was four foot, 10 inches tall and weighed about 100 pounds. While her and her husband had no children, she loved to play with her black dog. Melissa was renting a room in a house when she was abducted. Her husband was stationed elsewhere and they were actually preparing to move to California. After Melissa's autopsy revealed that she had been raped, the charges were upgraded to capital murder and two additional charges were added, including rape and abduction. HBO Max presents... Love and death. It is human nature to take risks. Would you be interested in having an affair? Starring Elizabeth Olsen and Jesse Plemons. You need to be careful. Betty Gore was murdered by someone she knew. The new Max original limited series, Love and Death, premiering April 27th on HBO Max. The truth has a way of coming out. Listen to the official Love and Death podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Stanley Berkeley was convicted in March of 1992, and he was sentenced to three life sentences for his part in Melissa's rape and murder. You might remember that Stanley did not actually partake in killing Melissa, but he was convicted using the felony murder rule. The felony murder rule means, in the words of the Virginia court, that the, quote, killing is so closely related to the felony in time, place, and causal connection as to make it a part of the same criminal enterprise, end quote. I mean, Melissa was found dead in the house, but Stanley told the investigators that he never saw a woman in the house. Also, his DNA was found inside the victim, so no one was feeling any type of sympathy for this dude. Andrew Chabrol pled guilty to the capital murder charge, and the judge accepted the guilty plea. In deciding an appropriate sentence, the judge considered all of the facts, the aggravating factors, and the overall evilness of the plan. The aggravating point in this case was referred to as the vileness of the facts. The victim, as you know, was abducted. She had to endure mental anguish for 30 minutes on the car ride to Andrew's house. Then she was, no kidding, tied and sexually tortured by two different men. Then she was strangled, her face wrapped in duct tape, and then wrapped in a plastic bag. With the evidence presented at sentencing, including Andrew's own statement, Andrew was sentenced to death. 
Andrew was not intent on appealing his case. He was just going to accept it. However, with the death penalty came the automatic reviews by the state courts. In February of 1993, however, the Virginia Supreme Court upheld the findings and the death sentence in Andrew's case. Because there is no automatic look at the federal level, Andrew Chabrol was now actively sitting on death row waiting on the day. And that day finally came on June 17, 1993. Andrew was 36 years old and he died in the Greenville Correctional Center in the electric chair. The Miami Herald reported that Andrew's death sentence was the fastest executed death sentence in Virginia since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. And well, while Melissa should have been able to rest easy after the perpetrator that took her from her family was dead, that was not the case. Because after Andrew was cremated, he was interred at the Arlington National Cemetery. What? Yes. If you're outraged, join the club. Because these are facts. If you just visit the Arlington National Cemetery in person or just peruse the website, there is so much rich history there. The website boasts that the grounds honor those who have served our nation and provide a sense of beauty and peace for our guests. The mission is to represent the American people for past, present, and future generations by laying to rest those few who have served our nation with dignity and honor while immersing guests in the cemetery's living history. Clearly, this was not a place where an officer who harassed subordinates while on active duty, a man who lacked dignity and a man who lacked honor, should be interred. Yes, yes, his DD-214 or whatever it was called back in 91, yes, it did say he served honorably. But did he really? His post-military service was so egregious that he should not have been allowed to rest easy at Arlington. However, at the time, and for decades later, there was no law precluding Andrew's remains from resting with those who actually did serve honorably. Arlington Cemetery officials were asked to remove Andrew's ashes. They were asked to remove the plaque with his name on it. But the argument they always gave was, sorry, we lack the authority. Until a victim advocate named Judy Farmer started a change.org petition. She started this petition to raise awareness of the injustice and to bring about change for the sake of Melissa Harrington. As reported by Hope Sec in the Washington Post back in 2022, Judy Farmer is a Navy retiree and she learned about Melissa's case in 2018. She was shocked to learn that a man who died as a result of a death penalty sentence could actually be in Arlington. Even more shocking was a note that she received from Arlington Cemetery, or the people who are in charge, telling her that there was no law that precluded him from being there. She was like, oh, wait a damn minute. You're telling me that Arlington is literally running out of space to bury veterans? SecDef is a hoorah sexual assault prevention advocate, but come again now? Of course, when one of Andrew's family members was asked to comment, a family member by the name of Robert Tabor, he was like, I like where he's at and I don't want to change anything because he earned that with his service in the military. Side note, apparently Andrew was notified before his death that his request to be interred at Arlington was approved. And Chaplain Russ Ford, who was like the prison chaplain, he remembers Andrew beaming with pride and joy. Of Andrew Chabrol, Chaplain Ford literally said the following words, quote, he was fundamentally evil and beyond redemption. I mean, listen, I have met many a chaplain in my day. And for those words to come out of a chaplain, that's a big deal. Well, drumroll, please. Hope Sack just reported last week, April 2023, for the Navy Times, that Andrew Chabrol is, no kidding, scheduled to be disinterred and booted from Arlington National Cemetery. When I first read this, I got goosebumps and my eyes welled up with tears. Hope further wrote, quote, passed in December of 2022, 
in the fiscal 2023 National Defense Authorization Act was a provision introduced by outgoing Representative Jackie Speer that requires the Secretary of the Army to remove Chabrol from Arlington by September 30th, and they have to transfer his remains to next of kin, or if no one responds to the Army's request, to dispose of the remains as deemed appropriate. The exact date of when Andrew Chabrol will be given the boot will be kept private. But Melissa's loved ones and supporters are hopeful that they will be able to mark the occasion by visiting her in Norfolk, Virginia, where she was laid to rest many years ago. Melissa's husband, Joseph, spoke out about how difficult it was to go public with Melissa's tragic story. But he was amazed and he was taken aback by the support that Melissa's case garnered and how people came together to advocate for Andrew to be disinterred. He was especially thankful for Farmer, who had been carrying Melissa's torch for the last several years. Of the entire situation, Judy Farmer, in essence, said, Andrew thought he was getting the last word. Huh, turns out Melissa got the last word. True Crime Warriors, I had a completely different case lined up for today, but for some reason, that case just didn't feel right. And then, during the Instagram Live last week, someone mentioned this development in this case. And the very next day, I did the research and I got to writing, and the story practically wrote itself. Cases like this make me see the good in the world. It also made me realize that sometimes old rules are dumb. The fact that the man got to rest among heroes for three decades is insanity, but it's never too late for justice to be done. I do think it's interesting to learn that that 2013 NDA doesn't specifically talk about situations like this. It only talks specifically about Andrew Chabrol. So we shall see if anything like this ever happens again. Thank you all so much for joining me today. If you're interested in supporting this show, just a reminder, you can find more content on patreon.com slash military murder. And if you listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe to my premium content there for as little as $5 a month. Just so you know, there are over 30 extra full-length bonus episodes, so you are guaranteed to find stories you have never heard on any other podcast, I promise. My sources for this episode included a Virginia Supreme Court decision, a Virginia Court of Appeals decision, and articles in the Navy Times, Washington Post, Richmond Times-Dispatch, Miami Herald, Change.org, and ArlingtonCemetery.org. Military Murder is a Mama Margot production. The theme music was created by TyOps. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next time. I was working on her podcast. I don't want to.